for joining our presentation today. Um, on the rule set is here. It's time to get serious about CMMC. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the agenda for the presentation today um, and make some introductions to those who will be presenting. Uh, and then we will go ahead into the content of the presentation. As many know, there's been quite a bit of more momentous activity regarding uh, finalizing the CMMC rule. And any of you that are suppliers or providers to this are going to have to comply with this in one form or fashion, depending upon the levels that you are at. Um, Mike, if we could go ahead and move on to the agenda slide. Absolutely. So uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit, we'll make some introductions. Mike will go in and talk a little bit about the DFAR rule. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit around Digital Beachhead and how they can help with uh, helping you get prepared. And then also how SureShield can help with that as well. Please note that everybody who is here today will receive uh, copies of the presentation as well as a copy uh, of the video. Uh, we will take a couple of brief polls uh, mid part of the meeting uh, with some audience participation. And then we will at the end uh, have a poll for those of you who are interested in getting perhaps more help to get you prepared for this. So uh, we'll do some intros. I'm Tom Leahy. I am the SVP of Sales and Business Development with SureShield. We are a software provider that provides tools and, and software to help uh, meet compliance, security, uh, require and requirements. And today, our primary presenter is Mike Crandall. Mike is the CEO of Digital Beachhead, and he is an internationally recognized cyber expert, speaker, consultant, and uh, now business owner. And uh, his company, Digital Beachhead, is also a candidate C3PAO. So they are very, very close to all the activities that are going on around CMMC. And as we know, there was quite a bit of progress that was made in the middle of this year. There were some potential concerns that things might perhaps get delayed given um, the current political environment, meaning the potential for a government shutdown. But it even looks like as of today, we know that that has been uh, averted. So this continues to march along. And what that means for you as a supplier, is it's coming. And it can be a little, uh, if you're not prepared for this, uh, it's coming sooner than you think. You know, we're almost into Christmas and it feels like we were just into the beginning of last year. That's how quick some of these things will come along. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, to Mike. Mike's going to talk a, a little bit about current requirements and then insight as to uh, how this particular rule is moving along and what that means for you and how we uh, may be able to help. Um, we will probably go off video, at least right now, uh, during the course of the presentation, and then we will come back on to help answer any questions that you may have along the way. Uh, please do direct your questions to the Q&A portion of the Zoom uh, presentation. And with that, Mike, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mike. Um, I'm the CEO of Digital Beachhead, as they say. I've been doing cybersecurity, uh, started with the Department of Defense in the Air Force in 1990. Um, retired in 2010, close to 2011, and then uh, started my Digital Beachhead so that we could uh, help those smaller companies that are working with the Department of Defense become cyber secure. So DFARS, we're all there. We all have to meet the DFARS requirements. This is nothing new. Um, they've been in our contracts for a while. And why that's important is DFARS is telling us to meet NIST 800-171. And NIST 800-171 is what CMMC is following. So the only real difference is CMMC becomes the formal certification of your NIST compliance. So no longer is it just, I'm meeting NIST, here's my score, but there will be people who can come and audit you should that be required. 
So we hear about all the buzz. The buzz is out there about CMMC. It's been going on for years. Um, it's impossible to meet. It's more stringent than what even the government follows. Um, I don't even have CUI, uh, controlled on class information. So while this is all buzzing, there's one thing that's supposed to help answer that. And that is CMMC 3.0. It's the new rule set released by the DOD. Um, it will mandate via the DFARS Clause 7021 that the CMMC certification requirements will become mandatory. So no longer is it going to be NIST and self-certifying in the SPRS system. It will be a formal system through CMMC. So it's expected. This rule is expected any day now. That's kind of where we sit. The CMMC 3.0 rule timeline. We've been hearing CMMC is imminent. It's here. It's coming. It's coming. And then at every corner, it doesn't quite happen the way we think it's going to happen. What's changed is the DOD has officially released the rule set to the Office of Management and Budget under the OIRA, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. So they've been looking at the rule set that's required for it to become official. So they released it in July of 23. Typically it would take uh, 60 to 90 days for review, which puts us in October. Um, however, we're still noticing that the last meeting was at 17 October. So they have, they're still meeting on this rule set. And of note, the rule set accidentally got leaked or released in August. So some of us do have copies or we were able to see some of the release materials. So we have an expectation of what's coming and we're going to get to that in a minute. So as I said, the last meeting was in October. So we're expecting the rule to be released sometime this month. Um, we were a little concerned about the um, budget, Congress passing a budget because that would delay it. But since they have talked about passing an interim, we're expecting it to... Uh, be fully released in November. Uh, once released, there's a 60-day public comment period where we get to put our comments in publicly. And then the initial rule will be released as an interim final rule or a, propo a proposed rule. And it is a very big difference between the two. If it comes out as an interim final rule, as soon as the 60 days of comments are over, the rule is in place, meaning contracts will start having CMMC listed within them. If it comes up as a proposed rule, they're gonna have to wait until the, the agency, the DOD, responds to all the public comments. The previous CMMC 2.0 was released as an interim final rule because they thought it was important to get it activated right away. So we are kind of anticipating this to come out as an interim final rule, meaning that it will start to appear in contracts by quarter two of 2024. So that's past the 60 days, and then it'll come out. And then in quarter two, we will notice CMMC as a requirement. Again, so we're looking at the out. spring of next year that very well this could be in place, right? That's right. It is, it is no longer if, but when, because the DOD has released the rule set. So with CMMC 3.0, what's new? What did we kind of get out of uh, published? The scope has changed to include security protection data, which could be your log data, your configuration data, and your system security plan. They all have to be protected as if they are CUI. So that means a lot of the actions and, and control sets we've put in place currently may have to be changed or modified to meet these new security requirements. EMAS, which is a tool that the DOD currently uses to uh, manage their approvals to operates and their network security systems, has a new database specifically for CMMC. So you'll be uploading all of your documentation into CMAS or your 3CPAO, 
who audits you will be uploading your information into CMAS, depending on whether you're self-certifying or having to be certified by a 3CPAO. A big one, the third bullet at level one and two, uh, an executive. So no longer your IT person, but an executive in the company will have to sign a letter and upload into EMAS that you're certifying that what your score, what you're saying with your compliance with CMMC is still accurate. There have been no. So while you're certified for three years, when you get your CMMC certification, you still are going to be required to have a yearly attestation that you meet all of those criteria each year with no major changes. And those could be potentially subject to false claims if what they've su submitted is not the fact, right? I mean, absolutely. Uh, we are noticing that right now. That's a great, great point, Tom, that um, Penn State is currently uh, in the court system for a false claim act based on their SSP poems and the accuracy of their documentation and what they attested to. Sure. Um, I have some personal awareness of that. Um, the whistleblower was someone who I have worked with in the past. And so it is an app, actual open court case right now between Penn State and the U.S. government for falsifying their um, attestation to being compliant with CMMC or at this point, NIST. Yes, yeah. So it is... Uh, they're planning to put a stick is kind of the point there. There will be a stick behind, not just carrots for getting it done, but are making false statements. And they are using, as Tom said, the False Claims Act as the stick. The rules for prime to sub are going to be established in this rule set. Uh, it's going to be and definitively will be the prime's ultimate responsibility for their supply chain. So it'll be determined from the prime, what they want to push down. So if any of you are subcontractors, you already know that a lot of the major primes are pushing heavily to know your scores, to understand your IR plans, incident response plans, your business continuity plans. Um, so that is coming. We had a client meeting this morning and our client told us that one of the primes was specifically asking for a business continuity plan. And not just that they had one, they wanted a copy of it. So the primes are going to start pushing the security down the hill. And then we are all, if you are listening to NIST or watching the NIST controls, we know that NIST revision three is going to be out probably quarter one, maybe quarter two of next year. They're going through their revisions and uh, question stage, open question stage. Right now, we are unaware of how or if that will be incorporated whether CMMC will stick to revision two for now or whether revision three or the worst case scenario is they don't incorporate a revision and just say the current version, which means uh, could be major updates to how our controls look because revision three of 800-171 has a major change to how they uh, monitor those 110 controls. They kind of shake them up, change them around, add a few uh, take a couple, merge them into one. So it is a, it is not just a small pen and ink change. It will be a major change to the NIST score and how they do their 110 controls. So Tom, did you have a survey you wanted yeah, to hit? Yeah, so we're going to just take, given that, as you said, we're going to take a brief little poll with the folks that are here um, regarding, you know, uh, one, have you actually gone ahead and have you conducted a NIST 800-171 assessment yourself as a company and submitted that data? And uh, two, you know, uh, whether even if you have, based upon what you're saying, Mike, um, those plans should be looked at again uh, and updated, uh, right? Because I know that right. uh, part of also what I understand is coming is there are going to be certain controls that they've indicated will not be allowed to go on a plan of action and milestone. There's going to be some controls that they're indicating. You just have to have it in place. There's no time for you to update that basically. So it will be very important that you are, if you haven't done so, you're reviewing and revising that plan and making sure that you have, you know, good 
expertise available to look at that to make sure those things are in place, right? Absolutely. And the the confidence knowing that you're going to have to have one of the senior executives sign off in that how you answered these 110 controls that you're very confident in the answer, uh, considering that they are planning to come out with a stick afterwards. Absolutely. So it is it is imperative that we don't just pencil whip, as we used to say in the military, our, our answers. We want to know and have good definitive evidence of to back up our answers. Great. Um, that's that's going to be like critical. Even here, there's uh, half of the respondents, more than half the respondents, have not done an assessment. So I would tell you if that is the case, um, and you are participating and planning to participate as a supplier in this program, you'll need to get that done regardless, um, because that will not. That's a requirement today. Uh, and then I've also seen that a lot of folks have not necessarily updated that plan. And it would be a good idea now, given the momentum that is happening happening with this, to go back and take a look at that plan. And, you know, I can assume, Mike, that anyone that's at a level one, most likely that's going to be, or at least the level one controls are going to be like a mandatory baseline, no poem, no nothing as it relates to something like that. And then there will probably be others beyond that, but you can be, you know, you can almost rest assured that if you don't have those all in place, you're not going to be meeting the requirements. That's right. And even with level one, where you're going to become level one CMMC certified with the 17 controls, uh, there's been no mention that they're going to remove the requirement to work towards the 171 full 110 controls. So while you'll be mandated to certify yourself that I guarantee I've met the first 17, you're still supposed to provide a score and know where you are towards the full scope of 110. Right. Yep. So the CMMC, the time, timeline for 3.0, um, how long does it take to become compliant? And on average, this is what we're seeing in the 3CPO community, a company of 100 employees or less um, usually takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months for full compliance to go from your average SPRS score, mid-range score, to completely compliant or meeting almost, I would say, almost all to, if not all, 110 controls. So why does it take so long? Uh, you have to scope out your assessment. You have to have your network diagrams, your connections, know your data flow, if you have CUI, uh, know how you receive it, where you store it, how you send it. And then most importantly, who are you connected to? What are your cloud providing services? Do you connect to other organizations, say your prime directly, network to network? Um, there are 14 domains with 110 controls to meet compliance. Every control, so all 110 controls need to have a policy and procedure developed. You need to have evidence to support it. You just don't get to say yes or no. And I have a policy and procedure. You need to show and prove that you've met that compliance. And then lastly, if you are missing any, you need to develop a full program of actions and milestones, POANM, which not only says I am missing this control, but have a detailed outline for compliance with a timeline of expectations. Of it will be met by with whatever final date. And then finally, Having all those in place, you can finalize your system security plan, your SSP, so that it outlines as a document exactly. Um, we have a quick question. Apologies if I missed it. Towards the beginning, does EMAS system replace the PIE SPRS scoring? If not, how does it relate? Um, we are not sure if it replaces it, uh, but it will definitely be how CMMC is tracked. Um, they haven't told us if they're just getting rid of the SPRS score. Um, how it would relate is CMMC, you would say, I am certified at and have a certification. So if you're level one, you're self-certifying. So you would have to throw up your documentation because EMAS is about showing the documentation where your SPRS score 
is very much about just putting the score and showing dates. If you've updated your SPRS, you know it's what date did you do this and what date did you do that? It doesn't have the actual documentation. EMAS is gonna have the documentation. My gut is telling me that they're gonna replace SPRS in the long term, probably not in the short term, because if you have EMAS, it will have all your documentation plus your score. So I think that uh, that would answer that one. But if you have more questions on that, Logan, feel free. So now that we kind of know why it takes so long to be compliant, let's dispel some of the rumors that are always floating around about uh, CMMC, that the compliance costs are prohibitive, that it just can't be done, it's too expensive. So the biggest thing for the cost is understanding where your data is and how your data flows, having a good network diagram of your system so that you can actually outline what needs to be or what falls into scope. Scoping is key. So the thing there is to make sure that your scope is um, well-documented. And that comes with diagrams and understanding where your data sits. Uh, the next big rumor is that everyone needs to be on GCC High to make this happen. And while that is a solid but expensive solution, it can work. There are other alternatives. And we must know that just sitting on GCC High doesn't guarantee 100% compliance. There's still some tools and um, configuration sets that need to take place to uh, make you compliant. Um, also with the scoping, does everyone need to be on the GCC High or can we limit it to a subset of users? And then the big rumor about every cloud solution needs to be fed ramped. Well, cloud solutions require fed ramp equivalent is how it reads not that it has to be fed ramp although our discussions are saying they are going to look for fed ramp so that's something to think about um another thing to think about is that there are solutions to where the cloud service provider is using a fed ramp cloud aws cloud um they could be working on Azure cloud that is in the uh, FedRAMP's approved cloud. So that's where you're going to need to determine whether the company is FedRAMP or the cloud is FedRAMP. Um, so we have a question. Given that they're a small firm, how do we know if this is even necessary? Um, you have no access to government systems, nor do you store government data. Uh, the answer to that is simple. If you have a government contract, so if you provide work to the Department of Defense, this will be required. Um, not storing government data. Um, if you have a government contract, you actually are storing government data because you're storing their contract. That's called Federal Contract Information, SCI. And there's at least a level one CMMC requirement. So, um, Anyone who does work for the DOD will require some level of NIST slash CMMC compliance. Um, and just to save the contract, that's absolutely correct. Just to have the contract, it's because you're doing work for the DOD. It's beyond the data itself. They're saying anybody who does work and is a contractor for, so if you're recruiting and putting butts in seats, the beauty is you only have to follow level one. You won't have to follow the entire, you, you won't have to meet all 110 controls. You'll have to work towards them, but you definitely have to uh, meet these and it should be in all your future contracts. And Go ahead, Mike's pointing out, remember there are different levels. So folks that are not handling to the same degree that CUI, you will have a minimum base requirement that will not be as quite as comprehensive as all 110 controls, but nobody can escape that either. So if you are servicing a Department of Defense contract, regardless at what level, you're going to have to meet one level of these requirements. So another great question just came in. 
non-US entity providing services overseas? Will we require it to be in compliance with the levels of CMMC? Uh, that's a great question. If you're providing them to the Department of Defense, um, services, they may require it. You may get an exemption because you're not providing, um, there are examples of exemptions. This would be a great example of where an exemption could take place um, because I'm assuming you will not have any um, specific things other than that FCI, other than the contract data. Um, so the best person to ask for that, Ali, would be your contracting officer, but I bet they're going to put in for a, a, an exemption for you just specifically based on where you're at. Um, I will say if they do require it, you'll be at level one, um, which is the 17 controls. In, in the end, I would always recommend doing something towards cybersecurity. Uh, the government would appreciate that in all government contracts, specifically the Department of Defense. So and how do we make... depend on what level of services are being provided there as well, correct? Yeah. In depending upon the, the sensitivity of what might be done, they certainly, if it's more sensitive, they will probably want to make sure that good controls are in place. Absolutely. Um, I'm thinking with this um, maintenance, labor, providing those kind of services, you may get an exemption. But if you are actually doing data analysis or doing any work with data or government systems, you probably will not get an exemption. You, you will be required. And another question is, if we work for federal civilian agencies and do not work or decide not to bid on DOD contracts, will this be required? Right now, this is DOD only. Um, this is a DOD uh, funded and test program that they're implementing. Uh, the word is, though, once the DOD fixes it, figures it out and gets all the, the uh, kinks out, as we know, with any new program, uh, they will move it and other agencies are planning to pick it up yeah, absolutely. For, for right now no if you were just working for the state department department of health uh cmmc is not a requirement it's under dfars the defense fars not the normal fars um but stay tuned yeah, <laughs> i think once it starts working and NIST is a very common state you know security standard so it would not be uh, unusual for that to get adopted in other agencies. I know we're already seeing Department of Labor, I know, has their own um, kind of control set, but uh, they're going to move into the NIST CMMC as soon as the DOD gets it out and operational. So how do we make compliance, quote unquote, easy? Um, we all know that compliance is never as easy as we think it should be. Um, but it's also not as difficult as a lot of us fear. So for us, it's preparing for the compliance, know thyself. Now I was speaking on that briefly. We need to know how your systems are set up. Where do you store your data? How does your data flow? Um, we like to say, get some professional help. A lot of times, even if you have an IT department or IT person, you know, they're busy keeping the lights on. So they want to keep the data and the bits flowing. They don't necessarily have time to run through and write policies, procedures, and make sure you're compliant ready. And then confidence in your self-assessment. If you've gotten that help and you've gotten um, the support you need to build out a CMMC slash NIST package, then you know when you're signing that attestation that uh, it is good. It is because you've got professionals behind you that are giving you the documents you need based on our experience. Is knowing you have a good program of actions and milestones to complete any open controls. So our playbook, what Digital Beachhead does, oh, we have a quick question. As an MSP supporting a level two sub required subcontract who has KUI in their environment, which you have access to, but with no KUI in our environment and no contract, Okay, that is a great question. How do we determine what compliance, if any, we must meet? That question goes back to the cloud service providers. So the answer there would be 
the way CMMC 3.0 was written based on the documents we've seen is if you're an MSP who is holding the data and you happen to have maybe your own data center, you will have to become level two certified. You'll have to meet the level of the people who you are supporting. Um, so that means any MSP that is holding data for a level two subcontractor will then themselves have to become level two certified. Saying that, if you're a MSP and you are just using um, Azure Cloud and the Azure Cloud is GCC high or meets level two, then you may be able to get your compliance through the cloud you are hosting the customer's data through. But to your point, Maria, if you have access to the data, then your company will probably more than likely have to get level two certified as well. Universities and their collaborators, great question. If the university has contracts or um, connections to the Department of Defense and holds Department of Defense data, you will have to more than likely in any future contracts and updates as with all government contractors, it will state the level of CMMC you need. But if your university is doing uh, say, Testing on space systems, I can almost guarantee that will probably be CUI at a minimum, ITAR at most, and you'll have to meet level two security requirements. So it's really based on the contracts you get, but regardless, you're going to see level one for everybody. There's not a level zero where you don't have to meet any controls. Yep. If you're participating in a DOD contract, you're going to have to meet these requirements at one level. Or and and they'll determine what those are, help you understand what those are. Absolutely, but if you the DoD have any kind of contract or memorandum of understanding, you know, some sort of connection agreement, you will have to meet some CMMC guidance. So if you fall under any DFARS clause, you will end up getting this DFARS clause when it's released. So our little playbook: How do we help people? Um, we want to kind of tell you what we do. Compliance is achievable, affordable, and you can have some cybersecurity along the way. Uh, we re really like to say we don't want you just to be compliant. We'd like you to be secure as well, because it's kind of pointless to become compliant if you don't actually have some cybersecurity in the background. We have a step-by-step -step process. As mentioned earlier, we're a candidate through CPO. We're awaiting our um, audit from the government. The DOD is going to audit our company. We're on the line. We're in the list. Uh, we're hoping first quarter next year. Um, and, and will this affect SIBR and STTR grants? Yes, it will. Um, I will say I've seen some of those grants uh, not get a waiver, uh, but depending on the type of work you're doing, it may allow for a waiver. Uh, some brand new, super highly valuable typically in the space industry. Um, they've kind of said you don't have to follow DFARS, but if you work with the government, those are rare, uh, but it is possible. But it will, it, you are definitely going to be on the hook and it might be the exception depending on the technology you're creating with your grant. So we provide, as, as part of this, we're also a small business. We like to work with small businesses because we know the pain of trying to get the same level of security as a large company because NIST 800-171 doesn't have a small business part and a large business part. It is just 110 controls, regardless of your size. And we've worked with um, small businesses down to a single individual that we literally say is me, myself, and I, and they have to split the roles between those three. So it is possible to get there. How we kind of do it, we start off, we review your controls. We begin some awareness training. If you don't have that already, we start our dark web monitoring on your domain and give you some Intel reports monthly. We provide you with your, your SPRS score and we can help you upload it if you've never been into that system before. We can give you some advice on how to do that. We do an evidence review. Each control and work with you to find how you can prove you're doing it. So two-factor authentication, as an example, we get you into your system and show that you have 2FA or multi-factor turned on. It's usually a checkbox. So we did a screenshot. That's evidence to prove that you're doing it. 
Then we do your gap analysis. What controls aren't you meeting? We create your POAM and that begins your monthly POAM review. Where are we? What are we doing? We create policies and then we review them to make sure that they are meeting your company specific needs. Um, along with your policies, that's when we also write the procedures. Then we do your initial system security plan, your initial SSP with all that information in it. We'll work to create an incident respond, response plan for you. We'll test it. That's another big thing, running tabletops. And then we finalize your evidence book. And then we close out the, the, the project with you. We like to do it over 12 months. That way we're a part of the team and it also spreads those costs over the 12 month period. And with our partners here, SureShield, they have the repository where all this data can be stored. So that way you have a nice point for all of your documentation, your policies, procedures, evidence, all of that stuff can remain in this nice repository. Secondarily, uh, SureShield will allow you to do the vulnerability tests, which is at least three of the controls out of the 110, you need to do vulnerability scans. Their system, once you're put in, we can set you up to do vulnerability scans, be it on one system or 100 systems, whatever you have. I'll leave that one for you, Tom. They're asking about the slides. I think we can make them available. Yes, yes. All uh, Just as I mentioned, all the slides and, and the content of this uh, recording will also be sent out to all the participants, so you should expect to get that most likely later today. Uh, but yes, content and the video recording will be made available to you. And to kind of wrap up from us, we think cybersecurity, the path to cybersecurity starts with a conversation. No two systems are exactly alike. Um, you may have similarities, but everybody's network system is its own. So we like to start with a conversation and we don't just say, hey, it's this much and you can get it done. We want to know more about you and what you have and help you the most you can for the most affordable price. Because uh, being a small business ourselves, we understand price point is key and these compliance things can be an added expense that we're not necessarily geared up for when we started our goal of starting a company. So we we sit back and we we will wait and hope that uh, you'd like to start a conversation with us and we can help you get moving forward. And to that, I'll pass it over to Tom. Great, thanks, Mike. And thanks for the presentation. Um, as we mentioned, uh, this is coming and I see a number of you folks have, you know, have responded that you have not yet done any kind of an assessment. Uh, if you're participating now, that's something you should be doing. Um, you're required to do. But, uh, you know, given what's going on in the world right now and the types of attacks that are coming every day, as Mike mentioned, it's not just uh, people do things to be compliant, to make sure they can get their, you know, their contracts and to not uh, forsake potential revenue. But ultimately, having good sound security practices in place is just good for your business overall. Um, so with that, uh, if there is interest in scheduling, uh, the folks from Digital Beachhead are more than willing and happy to schedule uh, a complimentary consultation with you. If you are interested in that, you know, please go ahead and respond to the poll as well. And we'll make sure that people reach out to you. Uh, but we also can go ahead and take any other questions you may have. And maybe briefly, Mike, I can just tell the folks how SureShield supports, um, as you mentioned, your type of practice. Just yep. as indicated, you know, we provide a platform that companies like Mike's use to help streamline the process a bit. So we have a, an assessment tool that is used to help, as he mentioned, monitor the controls that are required, but more importantly, to have all the evidence back up. And we even provide uh, as a starting base prepackaged policies that are mapped to controls that can assist in an organization like Mike's will help you tailor them specifically to your company's needs. Um, but we, we try to help get out ahead of it a little bit so you're not just doing things and having to start things 
uh, from scratch. And then as Mike mentioned, there are some tools also that are part of security processes that are required as evidence to meet controls and we can provide and his company can provide and utilizes those to help in that uh, as well. So that's how we help support organizations like uh, Digital Beachhead. Um, let's go ahead. We still have uh, you know, about another 20 minutes, so we will buy you all back some time uh, if needed, but we do still have uh, other questions that just came across. I don't know if you if you pulled this one up from Daniel, Mike. Yep, I, I, I see that one. Um, a pretty small box for control review. Um, are you able to assist in scoping? Yes, we do the scoping. And when we do the control review, um, it, it effectively is just us asking you the 110 questions. So I, I will just skip back real quick and kind of go over that process, maybe to help you a little more. But the control review effectively is us going through and saying, do you meet or don't you meet? Before we get to that, we have already talked with you and found out where you have CUI, um, where your uh, CUI flow is going to be. But found with our experiences, sometimes asking those questions and then actually looking into our evidence and writing policies and procedures, you learn more, you see more. So our flow is typically, we start month one, 110 controls. Do you think you're doing it? Yes, no, and how? Very simple, very basic. When we do the evidence control reviews, the next slide, now we're getting into the kind of more meat and potatoes where we say, hey, show me how you meet this control. Show me where your data is. And that builds out maybe when we said, yes, we did it, we're not, or maybe when we said we weren't doing it, hey, you don't have to, your data doesn't even flow there. So it does, and that's why it does expand. And we like to do it over the period of 12 months because we'll grow with you and we'll learn more about your, your uh, company instead of just coming in, giving you an assessment where we just ask the questions and leave. So as we get into that gap analysis, that's more to your question, are you scoping out? This is where we can really define your scope. Are we inbounds, out of bounds, getting into the policy creation and review? So I hope you see that it, ex it extends over this 12 month period, but it isn't just a yes or no. We do help you scope do what you need because that's how we're going to save you the money in the long run. Um, if you have two, 100 employees, but two of you work on a DOD contract, um, we probably don't need to get all 100 people. <laughs> into a GCC high or something. Right. And I think this video, we're recording the video as well, James, and uh, we can make the video available. I know I can make it available. Yes, yes. As part of this, you'll also have the, um, the recording. And so the answered live, uh, I would encourage you to just listen to the questions and those are, you'll have those as, as available um, answers for you as well. I think the, the bottom line for me is it's coming. Um, so, and, and, and it is the rule sets with OMB. So before, when the DOD kept saying, it's coming, we're going to drop the rule set, we're going to drop the rule set, we kept getting prepared. And I know a lot of us had said we've been, you know, following the boy who cried wolf with the DOD. Um, the difference now is they've released the rule set. So that means this is what the DOD um, has got, right? They, they, this is their rule set. They, they have released it. So now it's just scrubbing it, going through public comments, but it is coming. So now it is no longer, well, we'll see MMC make it. They've dropped the rule set. It is coming. It's just a matter of when, depending on how they release it and a couple of other factors, but it is no longer a, uh, I wonder if this will die on the vine or whatever. Right, or getting it. adjusted again too, right? Because you have yep. the level one and the level twos or the, the 2.0. And it, clearly now that they've done this, it's, there's no kind of going back, right? Right. And uh, Darren's comment, can I provide an annual cost estimate? It really depends on your systems, Darren. So I don't like to do just a gener generic because we really like to build custom solutions for you. Um, 
And Darren, I'd encourage you if, if I, I'm assuming you may have answered yes, but if you have answered yes to a consultation, uh, please do so. And folks from Mike and members of his team will follow up with you. Okay, good. Perfect. So it looks like you did, as I mentioned, any of you that have answered yes to that consultation, you should expect to hear from Mike and his team uh, to set up time to speak with you. I see yeah, several that are saying maybe later. I would encourage you to just, uh, if, if you haven't done the process, start looking at what your options are as to the best way you can begin that. Because as he mentioned again, it's a requirement today, but this rule is coming. If you want to continue to participate in any type of DOD related contract, you're gonna to have to have something in place. And it's got to be valid, as we mentioned, uh, Part of the reason that CMMC came about is because there were folks that were at least believing that they were attesting to something and they really hadn't. And we were running into lots of, as we know, um, hacks and data stealing from uh, foreign entities. Uh, look at, uh, Mike can probably attest better because he's an Air Force guy. You know, look at some of the latest Japanese, or I mean, uh, Chinese uh, fighter jets. They look almost exactly like ours, right? Probably yeah, almost they, so, exactly, exactly, yes. Yeah, they're like, they are exactly like ours, right? Because yeah. that data got uh, stolen. And that's a very dangerous thing for us. So it's very serious. And, um, you know, but as Mike's also pointing out, there's ways that you can meet these compliance requirements without making it as difficult as you might think it may be. And, you know, folks like his company can really help you with that as well. And another question, um, what kind of ongoing support can you have to tell your executives that have to be made to make that attestation after the end of the project? Um, that's really up to each company, but effectively you have those 110 controls you have what you've implemented in this POAM. The POAM will tell you what you need to do, what you need to invest in to meet the remaining open controls. Um, apart from that, we recommend, of course we do, we provide these services, but we recommend having some sort of uh, what we provide as a virtual CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, that um, executives can kind of lean on and say, okay, my team says I'm here. What do you think? Um, so apart from the 12 month, you know, contract to get you ready, we can just go into a lower cost kind of advise and assist and, and, uh, helping both the IT department and we do that, what I call translation between the two. And I would, uh, of course, we don't have all the information out yet, but I would imagine like even those that have to go through the certification process may intermittently need to provide some type of attestation that they're still meeting the proper requirements um, in between that time frame too. Yeah, if you get a new prime, the prime might want a attestation or, you know, depending on what happens along the way. Um, and insurance, cyber insurance is getting to the point where you have to answer questionnaires that are almost as hard as the, <laughs> yeah. the certification now for uh, CMMC. So if you've ever had those, you're like, oh, oh, oh Lord, I'm <laughs> there's 400 questions for insurance and only 110 to work with the DOD. Excellent. But well, I, we still have I, 10 I, minutes, but we'll leave it open. If, if we don't have any more questions, we'll buy the folks that have participated here back about 10 minutes of their precious time. Uh, we appreciate all of you joining us today. Mike, thank you for the very informative presentation. And uh, again, for all of you that are participating, uh, we're more than happy to help. Uh, this is an important, you know, important for your company and important for national security. And it's going to be something that, you know, you just can't avoid if you want to continue to participate in these types of contracts. So we hope to help make that an easier and less expensive process for you uh, as well. Uh, those of you that uh, indicated maybe later, you will continue to have follow-up and uh, content information from the folks at Digital Beachhead as well as from us. So please feel free to reach out should you have any other uh, questions.
in the future. And it looks like we got two um, or three more uh, quick questions here, Mike. Um, one, what do you recommend at SSP stage for controls that don't apply to level one? So what I do in that regards is I would set you up with uh, a CMMC SSP, which basically shows you're compliant and it shows the 17 controls. And then we would set you up with a NIST 800-171 SSP that basically outlines the whole control set. And that's just for ease of use. Say you, you can just say, hey, I'm being audited for CMMC level one. Here's that documentation. And then company-wide, you know, for your own cybersecurity, you can say, hey, I've got the full SSP uh, based on the whole NIST 800-171 control set. And I will uh, just point out as well um, that the software that we provide actually helps complete and create the whole POAM as well as the system security plan as well. So, and the nice thing there is that if you have changes or modifications, it's easily updated. Our and their platform. system is awesome and it provides the level one and the full control set is of the same price, you know, so when we book it in for you, it's one fee all included. And then last question before I think we wrap up, uh, if you're using cloud SaaS or other cloud services, can you use their security standards to complete your CMMC? The, the answer there is you have to use what they have in place, but that doesn't mean that you've passed the liability to the cloud SaaS. You're just saying if they are a FedRAMP, basically that's why the government is saying your cloud SaaS or cloud services, if they, then they're meeting that controls. And then what you're worried about is your control sets and the operational um, items that you manage within their cloud, you need to meet right. two-factor authentication, those kind of things. And they can be utilized as supporting evidence, right? So yes. as an example, I mean, you'll still need to, to complete your um, NIST 800-171 assessment for your company. Things that your cloud service providers may be doing for you may have be there to help meet certain controls. And so you have those backups as evidence to say that you've met those controls, correct? Correct. A great example would be you're in an Azure cloud running your Office 365. So uh, Microsoft is FedRAMP. So you meet those controls, but you still have to turn on two-factor authentication for all your users. So that's not something Microsoft does for you. It is something they are doing for their access into that cloud. And that's what their FedRAMP has proven, their FedRAMP approval but you still need to turn on all the buttons and switches that you need to, to secure your data within their SAS, their cloud. Awesome. Well, you have a, just about another six minutes. We'll, we'll hold for one minute to see if there's other questions and there is another one coming up. Uh, thank you, Logan. Uh, just uh, thank you for the, the comments, Logan. Uh, with that, I guess we will go ahead and wrap this up. And as I mentioned, Again, for those of you that have indicated you'd like to be contacted, expect a follow-up from Mike and Mike's team uh, and others. You know, everybody will receive uh, copies of the content and the webinar, the answers that are here, uh, very uh, informative. And actually, uh, the flow of this was very nice, Mike. Really appreciate that. And again, thank you, everyone, for participating. We will uh, go ahead and now conclude uh, the session. Thanks Thank again. you all for coming.